Hello, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at things that are going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online community for everyone who's interested in depth and union psychology. And Depth Psychology Alliance is free to join, and it's for the general public. We have everyone from scientists to scholars to students. So if you're interested in depth psychology and union psychology, please come to depthpsychologyalliance.com and sign up to become a member. We have lots of exciting programs there and uh, ongoing discussions among members about pretty much every kind of topic that you can imagine. And of course, we also have the book club, which occurs on, on regular occasion with authors and books that we find to be very interesting and, and extremely compelling for the world of depth psychology. And so this leads me to today's topic and author, which is something that really reached out and grabbed me quite profoundly, and I think it's going to be very interesting. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to what's going to happen as I talk with our author, Ariane Page, who has written a book called ISIS Code, Revelations from Brain Research and System Science on the Search for Human Perfection and Happiness. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about Ariane before we jump in. She studied and worked in communications. She was an assistant director for CBC TV of Montreal, where she has made her home. And she's a hygienist and a naturopath and a longtime manager of a natural health clinic. And she's also been involved in education science, which she studied while she was in college in Paris. And she has followed her interest in psychology, religious traditions, art, system science, and brain research. And this has all resulted after a, a long period of time in which her ideas came together in the elaboration of what she calls the life biosystem. And ISIS code is the reference book for this system, which Ariane is going to talk about. So Ariane, thank you so much for being with me today. Welcome to the show. Yes, hello, Bunny. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm just, again, so thrilled to have you here. You know, when I first saw this book, I was already very intrigued because I'm really interested in brain research and system science, both. Uh, they're two very different topics, frankly, but uh, it's interesting because they actually have a lot of crossover when you begin to really start looking at them. And I, I picked up the book, and, and this is a very significant book. And at first glance, I, I was a little concerned about having it for the book club because it's so big, and to be able to cover this much material in a month might be daunting. But honestly, you know, whatever comes out of the book club in the month of September when you're going to be doing this on Deaf Psychology Alliance, I think it's going to be whatever is meant to come out of it and, and probably will focus on some very unique points that the groups themselves sort of decide. And so I'm going to let you talk we get into it a little bit about how you see that unfolding. but. I wanted to begin by just reading the first paragraph in the book, and this is what really grabbed me and made me want to dive into this book, which is well over 500 pages. And I will say also, by the way, very well written. It's, it's written in a voice that is so clear and simple and easy to follow that even if you are a bit daunted by some of the topics that might be discussed in here, I think it's really super accessible to everybody. And so that's a very compelling fact of the book. Let me just start with this paragraph. So Arian writes, at a time when our civilization seems devoid of direction and faces a global financial and ethical crisis, humankind urgently needs to re reassess its priorities. Health is obviously one of them, since in most countries, illnesses generate the highest expenditure. Surrounded by all sorts of comforts, we are plagued with more chronic diseases than ever before. Even our mental health deteriorates. This is nonsensical. Could it be that we overlooked something about human evolution? Could illnesses and environmental catastrophes be the only wake-up call nature can voice? And are we hearing this cry now that, thanks to cancer research, we come to realize that we cannot stay healthy and thrive if our environment is not healthy? Now, Arian, I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise here, I promise. But I just wanted to say, for me, that that was so profound because I'm hugely interested in what's going on in our environment and and how that is affecting us as a collective culture. You know, we've become so globalized now that even though we can still look at many of the cultures on the planet being separate, I also, you know, see that we are so much the same in so many ways and those boundaries are blurring more than ever and we are clearly acting and, and developing our cultures in a certain way that is um, completely, you know, as system science would suggest, re related to our environment. It's a cycle. We, look some, we do something that occurs and it affects our environment. Then something happens in our environment and it affects us. So it just becomes this ongoing eternal circle that is yeah. creating our development. 
Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you would just, I mean, in this book, you talk about everything from reproduction to bonding to union psychology to religion to medical and the illness that we just discussed to our, our psychological and biological development. Of course, it includes neuroscience. You even talk about singing, breathing, homeopathy. I mean, it's a, it's a vast, vast, <laughs> vast book. And I learned more in just in skimming and, and diving more deeply into certain chunks of this book than I have learned in probably reading 10 books on each one of those individual subjects. So, and again, it's so accessible. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a, a huge scholar in any number of these topics, and I, I just so appreciate the way it was written. So, you know, I'm, I'm just amazed by the, the body of work that you've put together, and I wonder if you can start out by telling us how you came to write the book, and how did all these topics sort of pull us in you that has now resulted in this really remarkable work? Well, there's, you know, it's what you say there is, is very beautiful. Thank you. But we live in a whole holistic world we do live in it but our society our civilization has taught us to see ourselves as separated from nature even when we talk about nature we talk as if there's nature on one side and we are on the other side but when nature is not doing well we are not doing well because we are part, not because the water is polluted, because the air is polluted, because the food is not good, but because we are part of it. So with this book, I wanted people to feel that, to understand that we are all part of one being. There's no separation. But this goes countercurrent to everything we lived. Now, why did I wrote this book? It started, of course, when I was very young, with the situation of my family where there, my, two of my si- siblings are handicapped. So, very young, younger than a normal person, I started asking myself some very deep questions, and I could not feel comfortable in how we lived our life. It was too analytic. To me, as a child, I felt as if I was one with nature. There was not the trees, the flowers, and then me on the side. It's like I was a part of it. And uh, the more I grew up and then I started working, I could see all those divisions even more blatantly that it was a a a problem for us, you know. So uh, eventually meeting with people with uh, alternative medicine and homeopathy and acupuncture and the research people of those groups, so when the Meridians were proven as a fact, fact, not something, just an idea, but a fact by uh, groups that were French, uh, researchers that were French, then I said maybe there's something that we didn't see. Plus also all the statistics yourself. If you look at the statistic of, of depression, for example, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Just in the state, to give us an idea, there's 19 million of American adults that will suffer from depression this year. Half of these are major depressive disorder. So... How is it that we are in a society of abundance with everything, all the food you can eat, all the, all the pleasure you can have, and people are more sick than ever? So there's something, and the, the solution is nature. It's nature that is sick, so we are sick. So the only way to, to understand what is happening is to understand how, how this whole uh, the earth, uh, the nature, and everything, how it works, really. But this, I'm not the only one who is saying it. It has always been there in, in our tradition, a more holistic uh, way of seeing things. And that's why I came to Carl Gustav Jung, uh, who was, you know, he was just at a time when the, uh, the physicist, and uh, those who are, were in uh, psychology, but they were all medical doctors, but the, 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 those in, in psychology, there was some link there. Uh, there was a link between Carl Gustav Jung, Albert Einstein, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, Pascal Jordan, Niels Borg, and, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, Einstein's protégé was uh, David Bohm, who talked about the implicate order. And when you said before that you were interested by system science, it's because already at that time, there was a feeling that this, this universe was organized. There was an order in it. We talk a lot about chaos, but there was this knowledge that there was an order. And even uh, uh, Einstein found his relativity uh, because he said that the world has to be organized. It has to be that way, and that's how he found it. So there was exchanges. We always think that on one side there's science and the other side there's psychology or or the humanities, but it's not true. There's always correspondence. And these two groups, uh, Carl Gustav Jung and this physicist group, were exchanging a lot, but we are not really aware of that. And uh, Carl Gustav Jung, as you know, wanted psychology to be scientific, so he he studied not only the tradition, but also what science was able to offer him at the time. The problem is that all the research that we have done on the brain, it's they are more recent than his time. At, say, 1950, he was 75 years old. So it's now that we have all the tools to be able to do what he wanted to do. I find that pretty right, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And actually, you brought up a really good point that I was thinking as I was reading this book, and that is, it's something that I've often thought, and that is that I believe that Carl Jung would look at this book as an extension of exactly what he might have wanted to do uh, as one aspect of depth psychology. Because it's it's actually integrating how our biology and, and our brain comes into the psychology. He was, as you said, he was yes. so interested in making psychology a science, and yet, you know, there's so much of psychology that is not a science, <laughs> because, we, yes. I mean, science is actually a misleading word, you know, it's a label that we put on something to say that we have, uh, you know, analyzed it, experimented with it, and come to some conclusion about it, but of course, we have not done with that with so many aspects of, of you know, of, of what is, and so I'm really excited by the idea that this is an extension to me of depth psychology, and I think the book is really illustrative of that. Yes, well, there's two things. As I name Wolfgang Pauli, who's the wave particle physicist, he was uh, corresponding uh, very often with Carl Gustav Jung. I think they even wrote a book together. But he uh-huh. was saying that the science has to find a description of nature that integrates both physics, so the physical world, and psyche. And that's exactly what the life biosystem does. The life biosystem is a law inherent to the five elements. It's not something that I've created out of thin air. It's something that is based on the Tao, which is uh, the the Chinese tradition and uh, model. But it was not only found in China. Of course, the Chinese called it the Tao, and then you found Taoism that was based on that. But it's also, you can find it in India, you can find it in Egypt, and you can find it in the tradition, also the Jewish tradition, and that's what I did in my book to show that there was a model that was uh, intuitively felt by all civilizations. And uh, when Carl Gustav Jung was doing his study on tradition, I have to say something here, quote something from him, because I, I, I really I think it's important for our subject. Taoism, which is life biosystem comes from, Taoism formulates, as you know, psychological principles, which are universal. These principles are so vast that it can be applied to the entire humanity. This is important. What the Occidental man needs is to experiment facts which cannot be replaced by words. And this takes me to why I wrote this book. is because now we have a fact, and the fact is the brain and all the study from the brain. So mm-hmm. if the model in Taoism, in the Ayurvedic medicine, in the Jewish tradition, the five book of Moses is the same, then we have to find it in the brain. So what I did is that I took all the brain research and I tried to see if the model fitted the brain, and it does. And mm-hmm. what does it do is that you find that in our brain we have different aspects that matures 
you know, when you get older, there's some different aspect that matures. So you can, they call cycle. So the line around to the five uh, elements are also linked to the cycles, and it's linked to structures of our own brain. And you can see that when the child grows older, there's different aspects of the brain that will mature, and those different aspects are also linked to some level of expression. And this is important because the model is there. So that means that the tradition that uh, Carl Jung studied so well are not just emotional things. They are really built upon a model that were felt by physicists that we find in all the traditions and that we can use now and understand through how our own brain functions. Wow, that is a really profound statement, and I think that that really pretty much sums up where we are today. In, in depth psychology, I've had a lot of discussion with the board for Depth Psychology Alliance, and, and we're hoping to move this even more to the community than we have. And, and it's around what is depth psychology today, you know, 2013 and moving forward. What is it? Because these kinds of new um, techniques like fMRI, you know, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain that allows us to actually see how the brain is working along with advances in quantum physics and and mm -hmm. things that we couldn't even begin to imagine before are now being validated. And, and as you say, the research is proving now over and over again that these structures actually exist. And, of, of course, archetypal psychology and, and the study of archetypes is such a fundamental piece of Jung's work. And, and he looked at them as blueprints, as structures that actually exist and pattern how it is that, that our lives unfold and take shape. And, of course, you, you refer to this image of an acorn. I would like to direct everybody to the website, by the way, in case uh, you aren't familiar with this program and you don't know where to start looking. But if you go to depthinsights.com, www.depthinsights.com, you'll see a link for the book club there. And this is the public page where we integrate a lot of the media that we do for Depth Psychology Alliance, which is a membership organization, uh, free to join, but it does require membership to access. And so if you go to depthinsights.com and, and click on the book club, you will see information about Arian September 2013 book club. And also, for the record, if you happen to be listening to this show later, after September has already passed, those discussions that take place will be archived on Deaf Psychology Alliance Book Club for the foreseeable future. So it may well be that you can still go there and, and as you read the book, reread the instructions and the, the discussion that goes along and, and begin to have some kind of experience of that for yourself. Uh, but anyway, we, there's a great picture of an acorn that Arian passed on to me to put on the website. And this whole idea of something being imprinted in us that we can't necessarily see on the surface, but is is a, almost a blueprint code for us to evolve from and to become more whole. It's really, really a beautiful image. Do you, do you mm -hmm. want to say something about that? I'm dying to dive into the next part. No, 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 no. Yeah. Go, go ahead. It's uh, and also because it it gives us the ability to understand more about ourselves and what is not going well in our world now, and also uh, for education. The the main point where you talk about archetype, and this is a main point. The the problem now with our uh, society, especially in countries such as ours, uh, USA, Canada, and Europe, is that uh, it's the, the there is a, an identity crisis. We are very we've been uh, driven to a consumerism society, which is not bad in itself. The problem is that we lost our identity. And we didn't find it now. And this is linked to an age from 14 to 21 years old. And just to give you an example, depression before would happen in people of 29 years old and up, which in, in my book is linked to the social aspect. Now it starts at 14 years old, which is what I'm just talking about now. It's the period of the identity, 14 to 21. And it's when now depression starts hitting. So we re what this uh, this system does, as this code does, knowing it, it gives us understanding. And now we really need to understand if we want to take the right direction and if we want to do something that is good for our children and the children of our children. 
And if we don't want a massive amount of people, even more than now, that would be depressed and have mental illnesses. It's very important because what we don't allow as expression on the physical level, we'll have it on a more subtle level, as you know, because uh, it's Jungian psychology also. So, no, no, go ahead. You can jump to the <laughs> other part, but I, I, I thought it, it's, it's important. And it's always this image of one. It's not a model on one side, and we, we are an extension of this. We are the manifestation of this unique model. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, all of this is connected. So, you know, I, I look, looked at it initially in terms of moving on with you in, in this particular conversation to the next question. But honestly, I mean, it just one thing flows into the, the other. And, and, and so I think um, where I was going with that, and, and it's something that you just alluded to, is this idea of how we encompass these various parts of ourselves inside ourselves. And and being able to come to an understanding of what exactly is going on in there gives us so much information and helps us to understand where we need to go next with that. So, you know, one thing that you've done which really intrigues me is in the midst of all the the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that you communicate about biology and neuroscience and various aspects of medicine, et cetera, is also that you have brought this together using Egyptian myths. And, of course, Egyptian mythology was also something that was huge for Jung. He really enjoyed that, uh, along with other great depth thinkers that we know, like uh, Joseph Campbell and and many, many others, of course. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a bit about what is the ISIS code? What does ISIS code stand for? Where did that come from and what does that encompass? And why is that the sort of the umbrella for this idea of life biosystem? Yes, because, uh, as I said, we have to find a direction and uh, if you listen at economists, they would say economy is the direction. If you, you know, health is direction. But the, the, the ISIS code is because I'm right, right there. I'm saying, well, Egyptian tradition gave us the answer, and the answer is ISIS. And just to uh, summarize a little bit that story, uh, Isis and Osiris are, uh, there's five main gods, you know, and Isis and Osiris are a couple, and their brother, who is named Seth, decides to kill Osiris. And he kills his own brother, and he cuts the body of Osiris in many pieces, and he puts all these pieces across the universe. It's longer than that, but just to make a short story. And Isis goes and she tries to find all the pieces to put them back together because she wants him, she wants Osiris, her husband, to be alive and to come back to this earth. So she wants to recall the soul of Osiris. Now, these gods, these five gods, are five different aspects also of our brain. They're five. They're linked to the five different aspects of our expression in this dimension of time and space. So you have the physical aspect, which will be linked to Neftis, who is a sister of, of Isis and Osiris. You have the emotional aspect, which is Osiris. You have the what I call the human or the archetypal aspect, which is Horus, their son, the son of Isis and Osiris. Then you have the analytical aspect, what we wrongfully call the rational brain, the rational mind, which is Seth, who is the one who killed Osiris. And then you have the environment, the social, the universal aspect with Isis. It's Isis who can find all the pieces of Osiris. It's not the other aspect. So it's Isis which is linked to the environment, which is linked to universal aspects, which is linked to our social aspect, that can find all the pieces and put it together. Because for now, who we are individually, we're we're like Osiris. We have our mental aspect one place, physical aspect doing something else, our emotions, and then the soul is nowhere to be seen. We're all in pieces. Mm -hmm. And to be able to continue on the path of evolution, we have to be more whole. So this is why I call it Isis Code. And it's the code is the book in itself 
that will will help you to bring all your parts together. So by reading the book, you go from through all the different aspects of your brain and of your expression, and it's like a journey that you take into yourself to put all the parts together. You know, this is such a beautiful metaphor, Ariane. It's, it's really wonderful to hear the way that you describe it. And, you know, I'm thinking of Jung, when he talks about individuation, of course, he often ties that idea to being whole, the idea of, you know, becoming whole. One of the quotes from him is about how wholeness is not achieved by cutting off a part of your being, but by integrating the contrary. Mm -hmm. And I think this is exactly what you're suggesting, is that the, the ISIS factor, the ISIS code, is that great integrator, the thing that can bring us together. And it, I can't help but think, you know, as we're having this conversation in the last few days and weeks, there's been a lot going on in the country of Egypt where oh, yes. whose myth this is. And I, I just, I can't help but make the connection to how all these different facets that are really warring against each other and how fragmented they are is really the Osiris piece of it, how it's just been cut up into all these little fragments and how desperately they need this, this feminine factor, this connection, this connecting factor to bring them together. I mean, we all do, you know, but it's, it's just particularly striking to me because it is their myth and, and there's so much there for them to, to be able to garner from this particular story, which is their heritage. Yes, uh, it's very hard uh, what what they're going through now, and the problem is that as long as we don't have a complete picture, it's it's very difficult. And uh, when you were talking about the opposite, what the brain shows us more and more, it's that it's it's not even opposite; they're complementary. Mm-hmm. And uh, I talk in the book of these, even these five gods. There's aspects that are more of the feminine and more of the masculine, which is not linked to the gender vision we have of masculine and feminine, but more as expressive and receptive. And our brain even functions like that. And you won't be surprised to understand that in our society, we, we enhance everything that is linked more to the left hemisphere and not to the right hemisphere. But there's more to that because the limbic system is not left and right. But the cortex already mm-hmm. is very much uh, polarized and the two need to work together. And uh, it's a problem now because we have, it's like we have put set, if we take the analogy of the um, Egyptian tradition, we have taken Seth and we put him on the throne. He's our king. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that if we do that, none of the other exist. There's only that existing. And everything goes to that. And there's nothing left. And eventually it stops everything. The clock stops. Evolution stops. And the environment gets destroyed. There's no other way to do it because this aspect analyzes everything. But if you take a flower and you analyze it, you take it all in in pieces, there's no life left. It's dead. And that's what we're doing now. That's a problem. Yes. It is a problem. You know, you um, you really set Seth up in in the book as the great divider. He's the one who divides. And, you know, there's so much going on these days, too, with phenomenology and, and this idea of being in the moment and experiencing what's going on right here in the moment. If I look at that flower and I really allow myself to look at it without judgment, without analyzing it, you know, without trying to figure it out or figure out what it's doing, then I am just one with that flower. I, in fact, I am that flower in the end. And I think all of us can relate to experiences like this when we've just even been caught completely off guard by them, sometimes just walking in nature or sitting out in a garden or, or even sitting next to a, a vase of flowers and just kind of having that moment of connectivity. And I think when we analyze things, you're so right, we, we divide them from ourselves we separate ourselves from them and, and all of a sudden it becomes a whole world of other. You know, everything is an other than ourselves. Everything is an object and it becomes so much easier for us to objectify things and people, by the way. Yes. Well, that's, that's, what, it, that's what happened also. It's that we objectified everything, but an object has no life of itself. 
So, mm-hmm. and I talk about some mental illnesses, and the, that's one of the problem of a psychopathy is that the the everything is an object. So there's no emotional reaction or anything because everything is objectified, and our society mm-hmm. is pushing towards that. And the problem is that we, since we don't know the different cycles and what is needed in different cycles of maturation for a child, for example, from cradle to grave, there's, there's, we're missing some steps there. And there's, a, mm-hmm. it, it piles up. And then the old people that we have now, that we will have, are not at all what we should be because we miss too many things. A child is not supposed to sit on a chair and learn the uh, numbers when he's four years old. But we think because our aim is consumerism and productivity, then we we think that this is the best way to do it, but it's not. Mm-hmm. I remember even when my children were were younger, we would take them on holiday, not when other people were taking them on holiday. And the first year we did that, the teacher said, you cannot take your child uh, in the sun in winter. You know how Canadian winter can be uh, doom and gloom. (laughs) So I said, yes, but for their health, they need a week away. And But each time when they came back, they were better than the other children who, who, poor children, had no play but were in winter there studying when they should have been in the sun enjoying themselves. So we're trying, we're pushing, pushing, pushing because we want those children to perform at an age when what they need is nature to be outside, to to enjoy themselves. And and we don't understand that if you do that, they will be even better after. And this Mm -hmm. is something that has to go in our head. There are cycles and, and we need to understand what these are. Yes. Uh, Ariane, in your book, Isis Code, you talk very poignantly about love. And I'm mm-hmm. making this leap because I'm thinking about parents who are making their children sit and learn numbers when they're four think that this is a kind of love because they're teaching them to get ahead in the world. But this idea of taking them away from that to go on vacation or to go see the sun and be more healthy or to go play outside is is a much more unfettered kind of love and feels to me um, more natural and less inhibited. I wonder if you can say, well, let me just say, you quote Carl Jung uh, on this topic, which is a very, very profound quote and one that I had never heard before. And he says, somewhere there was once a flower, with a capital F, flower, a stone, a crystal, a king, a queen, a palace, a lover and his beloved, and this was a long time ago on an island somewhere in the ocean 5,000 years ago. Such is love, the mystic flower of the soul. This is the center, the self. And then he added, no one understands what I mean, only a poet can grasp it. I wonder if you can say something to us as we begin to wind this down about love and this flower that is the, the center of the soul. Well, this love is really the. Uh, I really like Carl Gustav Jung because to be able to talk like that and to feel like that, he's an Im- amazing person. He was an amazing person. But love is this, it's the link between the opposites. Because if there's a lover and a loved one, it's, it's like they, they become one. The ocean is like the ocean of existence. And the island we are, this earth is like an island. And we are all together on this earth. And the soul that is talking about the self is really that. We are one. We are that one being. We are that one soul, but expressed in many different Abilities. There's this crystal that there can be a castle. There can, but it's all the same matter or the same energy, as would say uh, Einstein. It's the same profound life that is expressed on different layer through different thing, 
but there, it's the one. In fact, what he's saying there is talking about the one. And it's very, just to hear it, why do we like it? It's because it's like we become whole just by reading that. We become linked to the one. And if you see in the book, I talk about this one being that we are. All of us together, we are this being. You can even have echoes of that in the Bible when they say that before there was no distinction between the, the, the races or anything. They were one. But then there was the Babel Tower that was built because God wanted division. What do we make of that? It's because the re our reality is one, is the oneness. And when you are in a time frame, when you have time and space, then there are divisions. But you can always go back to the one inside you to keeping this, mu it's like a music, a note that you keep in mind, a consciousness that you keep, and you have to repeat yourself. The reality is one. So th this sentence, that's, that's what it is. There's only that. It's the reality. You could say there's only one soul. That's, that's all that there is. It's, it's a little bit like the water who could come ice or can be... Uh, I don't know the word in English, but anyway, can be eyes, so you can see some some fog, but it's always water. It's the mm. same thing with love. It's expressed. So one could say that everything is love. And mm -hmm. here, when no, you're no. on this time and space, it's like it, it's the attraction always for everything that what is... There would be no manifestation if there was not those uh, complementarity or what we say opposition. Everything has a plus and minus. Everything is opposite, but that's what makes manifestation. When they get together, you have a manifestation. So it's it's it poets now. It's uh, we're we will all be poets once we understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's so beautiful. You know, I, uh, I'm reminded that James Hillman talked about separation and how we absolutely have to have it as a necessity in order to have the contrast for, for wholeness, you know. I mean, if, we don't ha if, peace, if things don't fall apart, then how can they ever be together again? And yeah. I, I think that sums it up really nicely. I can really see the, the beauty of this theory and you know, it, it's not, I, and I know you don't claim that it's new either necessarily. I think the no. very unique angle that you have is, is, the, is the way that you've put it together using neuroscience and medicine to be able to, to use this as a model for us to begin to understand some of these deep concepts that many of the mystics for, you know, since the beginning of humanity have, have discussed and talked about. But you've really just done it in such a beautiful way. And I really encourage everyone who has the capacity and the will to, to go get the book, you can <laughs> you can buy that book on Amazon and you can find it under, of course, its title, which is ISIS Code, Revelations from Brain Research and System Science on the Search for Human Perfection and Happiness. So look for ISIS Code. That's by Arian Page, A-R-I-A-N-E, and her last name, Page, P-A-G-E. Doesn't sound very French, by the way, Arian. <laughs> that's why you had me fooled. <laughs> but it's such a pleasure to have you here with me on the on the show today. I just want to let everybody know that you can find more about uh, the book club on depthinsights.com, and you can go to the book club link, and you'll find more about this particular book club there. And you can also learn more on uh, Arian's website, which is isiscode.com. I s i s c o d e dot com. And she has a blog, and she also has a Facebook page for it, I suppose. So please go check it out. Come join Arian in September on the Depth Psychology Alliance free online Depth Psychology book club. Uh, it's a written format, so you can just dive in and ask questions wherever you want, comment on other people's comments, go through the readings, and it should be a, an extremely, extremely revealing and, and fascinating process, and I, I really look forward to it. Thank you again, for Arian, for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to talk to everybody on the book club. Take care, everybody. This recording is a copyright of Depth Insights, Depth Psychology Radio, and Bonnie Bright, 2013.
please email info at depthinsights.com for any requests for reproduction.